Hi everybody, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you all today and I'm really excited about the fact that VDS is occurring both at KDD and Viz this year. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity to build bridges between our two communities and I'm looking forward to the sorts of conversations that will emerge after these events have occurred. So thank you very much to the organizers for, for putting all of this together. So I'll be using my talk today to think through some things that have been on my mind when it comes to interpretability for machine learning models. But first, some quick background. I lead the visualization group at MIT CSAIL, and we use data visualization as a petri dish to study broader issues in human computer interaction, namely ideas inspired by JCR Licklider and Douglas Engelbart around augmenting human intellect or the ways that software systems can help amplify our cognition and creativity while respecting our agency. What this means is that a lot of our research is focused on developing tooling around visualization, including widely used visualization packages like Vega and Vega Lite, as well as design systems like Lyra. And we've increasingly been studying the socio-cultural implications of data visualizations, including how they're being mobilized in really problematic ways on social media, and the ways that we can make visualizations accessible to people who are blind or have vision impairments. And over the last three years, we've also begun to work on issues of machine learning interpretability, approaching it with this more human-centric lens. And so as HCI and visualization researchers, it's been really heartening to see writing like this from high-profile machine learning researchers. So this is an op-ed for the New York Times that Professor Fei-Fei Li, who's a renowned computer vision researcher at Stanford University, wrote um, about three years ago now. And in it, she worried that our enthusiasm for AI is preventing us from reckoning with its looming effects on society. And that if we want AI to play a positive role in tomorrow's world, it must be guided by human concerns. And I completely agree. And there are a lot of different human concerns, right? Um, from frequently cited ones around fairness, accountability, transparency, all the way through to, you know, what are the interfaces that mediate our interactions with these AIs? And in my work so far, I found that interpretability is almost a central foundational piece that all these other concerns almost sit atop on. And this is especially true for deep neural network models like the one I'm showing you here, which are increasingly demonstrating just astonishing capabilities at tasks from image recognition to natural language generation. And so it's becoming increasingly tempting to deploy these deep models into real world contexts. And yet interpretability is such a pressing issue, maybe even more so for these deep models, because if I give this model a particular input, in this case, an input image, what I get out are you know, labels like these three. These are the top three labels returned by the Google Net um, model for this particular image. And as you can see, you know, we've got Labrador Retriever, Golden Retriever, and surprisingly, Tennis Ball. Right? So why does the model believe that this is an image of a Labrador Retriever more so than a Golden Retriever? Why on earth is the third most probable label a tennis ball? And how come there are just no labels in the top three here that are associated with the fact that there's a cat in the image as well? And so because of how pressing this issue of interpretability is, there's been an explosion of work in this space over the last few years. There's been a, a great amount of sort of technique oriented work happening in the ML community. But for today's talk, I'd really like to focus on the systems that we've been building in the Viz and HCI communities, which is where I've taken these screenshots from. And I'm taking that focus because oftentimes the explicit or implicit goals of these systems are to be directly useful to particular end users, right? To be guided by those human concerns like Fei Fei Li's op-ed was, was um, calling us to action. And so as we're seeing these screenshots, you know, we've been developing a lot of really rich interactive systems, right? Lots of really detailed, meticulous ways of analyzing neural networks from debugging their architectures, comparing individual instances, looking at attribution graphs and attention mechanisms, all the way through, you know, drawing directions on latent spaces and even training these models in the browser and seeing these learned representations emerge. And this is an area I've only begun exploring over the last three or so years. And so two of the questions that I've really been spending a lot of time thinking about as I've been acclimating to this space are, what have we learned because these systems exist? And are we really making meaningful progress? 
Now, by progress, I mean, is the work unfolding in some sort of systematic way? Are we building on top of work that came before us? And are we really developing the sort of understanding about how these various visual and interactive techniques that we see in these screenshots can be reused, composed together, the ways they might map onto different model architectures or user needs to be able to more reliably yield insight? Or, problematically maybe, are many of these interfaces the equivalent of throwing darts against a dartboard in a dark room, hoping to just sort of luck out and hit our target at some particular time? Now, to me, these can feel like really big questions um, that are difficult to kind of wrap our arms around. And so I take a lot of inspiration from one of the very first things I read as a PhD student, which was Herb Simon's The Sciences of the Artificial. And in particular, something he wrote in that has stuck with me ever since, which is that solving a problem simply means representing it so as to make the solution transparent. To me, this quote is really what the heart of research in computer science and design really is about. It's about the abstractions we use to model a problem space, the language those abstractions give us to formulate and answer questions, and the primitives that make up, the, make up that language, make up those abstractions, right? The nouns and the verbs and how we sort of fit them together. Now, this can all seem quite abstract, so to make it a bit more concrete, I wanted to start by taking a look at the overall space of machine learning interpretability. And back in 2016, Zach Lipton, who's a professor um, at CMU, wrote this great paper about the mythos of model interpretability, where he identified that actually, at least back in 2016, interpretability was a pretty poorly defined task. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For example, let's imagine a clinical decision aid system in a hospital. Now, doctors need enough information about the recommendations to justify their decisions. Patients probably also want confidence in the recommendations and to be able to explain those decisions to family members. The developers who built the system might want to monitor its performance, and physicians and patients are also well suited to provide them, you know, them, the, the developers, feedback about the errors. And then there are others that probably care about the system as well, including, you know, the medical staff that are supporting uh, the clinicians, regulatory agencies, as well as the people on whose data these models were trained on. And so interpretability in this context is an important problem, but can be a little bit slippery um, to, to, to define precisely. It can mean a lot of different things. Do I trust the model from the point of view of a patient? Will it work right in deployment from the point of view of developers? And does it give you the right answer for the right reason, which is probably at the forefront of you know, the minds of uh, regulators, doctors, medical professionals, so on and so forth. And so this has been a problem that a lot of researchers have been working on, and there have been two main ways that have repeatedly emerged from the literature uh, as a way to better frame interpretability. The first characterizes people by their expertise. So giving people, you know, different groups of users labels like AI expert, AI novice, domain expert, domain novice, or, or in some cases, you know, non-expert. And then the alternate way of framing the space is by the role that these people take on in the ecosystem. So model creator, decision subject, so on and so forth. And then the needs that they have with respect to interpretability flow from these labels, either their expertise or their role. So AI experts want to be able to improve system performance. Auditors need to be able to det detect bias. Model executors want to trust the model, things like that. So, how do we evaluate whether these frameworks are actually productive ways of modeling stakeholders and their needs, right? Using Herb Simon's framing. How do we actually evaluate whether these are good enough models? Well, here I, I draw inspiration from um, a framework developed by French HCI researcher, Michel baudouin lefant um, and in a paper that he published at CHI 2000, Baudouin Lafont identified that conceptual models should be able to provide three kinds of powers. A descriptive power, where the model should be able to describe all existing points in a problem space. A generative power, where the model can be operationalized to be able to systematically identify new points in the space and a comparative power, where the model gives us a language with which to evaluate two seemingly equally viable alternate points in the space. 
So if we look at each of these three powers in turn, we can see that the descriptive power, you know, it, this, this, these ideas of expertise or roles are actually providing us some valuable descriptive power, right? These roles are providing us labels that cover lots of different users. And so we can imagine starting to design systems that target, say, model operators or, you know, AI experts and so forth. But unfortunately, neither roles nor expertise are really well encapsulated or perhaps even granular enough for a lot of systems design questions, right? Um, multiple labels can apply to the same or many different kinds of users. And the fact that these labels can be shared or reapplied suggests that there may be an alternate representation that better distinguishes the properties that are shared from those that are distinct. Now, if we turn to generative powers, we might see that, you know, these ideas of roles or expertise don't actually capture a lot of cross-cutting needs. Like a lot of work in participatory design has shown how folks who we might otherwise consider non-expert might actually have valuable information to contribute to the design process. And it feels like a shame to just bucket all of that rich knowledge um, under the label of non-experts. And similarly, a lot of these frameworks don't necessarily take into account the ways that expertise or roles may evolve over time, or the way in which people might be able to transfer their skills from one role that they, they take on to another. And this is something that several um, researchers have found. For instance, Carrie Kai and her colleagues interviewed a number of clinicians and showed how doctors were able to adapt um, you know, their existing understanding of how medical devices worked and apply that knowledge as well as you know, dealing with associated uncertainties to the context of machine learning models in clinical settings. And finally, comparative power, um, you know, the ability to assess multiple alternatives. Well, unfortunately, neither expertise nor roles, I would argue, give us enough machinery to figure out how to conduct um, what Bean Kim and Finale uh, Doshi Velez refer to as application grounded evaluations. Right? It's sort of related to this idea of overlap. It's to say if we built a system for model operators, is it acceptable to recruit both medical staff and doctors and patients, right? They're all seemingly model operators. Maybe that's fine. In which case, what tasks would we set them? Again, you know, many of these frameworks um, leave that kind of unanswered. And so to address a number of these questions, um, you know, my, my PhD student Harini Suresh, along with our collaborators at MIT Lincoln Lab, Stephen Gomez and Kevin Nam, went you know, started to work on a framework where we were able to go beyond expertise and roles. In particular, we took this idea of expertise and decomposed it into knowledge and context. And by knowledge, we, we identified sort of three different types of knowledge that might exist. Formal knowledge, which is typically what we think of as expertise, right? Textbook knowledge acquired through extended education. Instrumental knowledge, which is basically the hands-on sort of training that we, that we end up uh, getting when we're building and using things. And finally, our personal knowledge, which is the intuition, informal tacit knowledge that we've built up over time as a result of essentially being people and interacting with these sorts of things. And these three types of knowledge can occur in a variety of different contexts, including machine learning in the data domain, which we already saw from previous frameworks, and to that, we add this idea of the milieu. And this is pretty interesting, right? It occurs at several different scales from the immediate surrounding context of the human AI interaction through to the broader societal context that might exist. And what's important is rather than building any kind of one-to-one -one mapping, what our framework does is imagine sort of a very rich cross product of these two sides. So for instance, we might look at formal knowledge and apply it to the machine learning context. And this would involve you know, the math behind model architectures, things like optimization and training. To the data domain, this might be theories relevant to the data domain, like symptoms and treatments in a clinical context or case law. And in the milieu, this would, you know, at the broadest, widest scale, involve things like sociocultural theories, right? Redlining, gerrymandering, mass incarceration. These things might matter depending on the sort of machine learning model that you're trying to build and the decisions it's making, right? These things could very well matter. 
And similarly, you know, we see instrumental knowledge occurring in these three contexts. So for machine learning, that would be familiarity with machine learning toolkits and off-the-shelf models. In the data domain, it's, you know, experience with related medical technologies or document mining tools or things like that. And again, in the milieu, it's, it's just sort of broad familiarity with the ML-enabled ecosystem, right? Things like virtual assistants and recommendation algorithms that are increasingly just pervasive um, in the milieu. And the fact that we've had, you know, folks have had experience with these other ML-enabled technologies are likely to shape their expectations, their interactions with whatever specific ML system you're designing um, right away, right now. And finally, personal knowledge, um, again, in these three contexts, looks something like this. So for machine learning, it's, you know, little tricks of the trade, hyperparameter values, feature engineering. For the data domain, it might be prior memories of similar scenarios that, uh, you know, the expert might have faced. And in the milieu, it's sort of the cultural knowledge, the values, the attitudes that have built up over time. And this is particularly important for, you know, minoritized populations um, who might not see uh, sort of formal or instrumental knowledge reflecting the experiences that have shaped, uh, you know, the way that they live today. And importantly, unlike prior frameworks, needs that, you know, uh, different users have don't necessarily just follow straightforward from their knowledge and context, but are rather a whole separate component of our framework. And we describe them across three levels. We've got these overarching goals. These are long-term, high-level, kind of difficult to define and evaluate the success of precisely. So things like building trust or, or gaining an understanding of the model. And these long-term goals break down into shorter-term objectives, which we can actually start to measure precisely, like how well have these objectives been met? Things like debugging or justifying decisions, learning about a domain, and so forth. You can imagine kind of, you know, fitting metrics around these ideas. And then those shorter-term objectives can be broken down even further into immediate tasks, and these tasks are things that we as systems designers can imagine designing for quite specifically. And what's important here is, again, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but a really rich many-to-many -many mapping from goals to objectives to tasks. Um, so one goal by me might be met by, you know, several different objectives. And similarly, you know, one objective might meet several different goals. Now, again, I've, I've mapped out this whole framework. Is it productive at all? Right? How might we evaluate its productivity, um, its efficacy? Again, we turn to Baudouin Lafon's um, three powers. So if we look at the descriptive power of this framework, um, you know, all of us uh, coded almost 60 papers from various research communities looking at issues of machine learning interpretability and human AI interaction. And the vocabulary provided by our framework, as you can see from this interactive figure, was able to describe you know, the stakeholders and needs that appeared in all of those prior papers. And in particular, that vocabulary also allowed us to find you know, where there are lots of clusters of work occurring as well as notable, noticeable gaps. So for instance, you know, there are a lot of papers around um, users who have machine learning instrumental knowledge or domain formal or instrumental knowledge. And there's actually relatively few papers on helping people understand how their data is being used or contesting a decision based on the model output. But what about these other two powers? Well, the generative and comparative powers, starting with the generative, our framework actually helps us develop new personas, right? We've broken apart that old idea of non-experts, and we've been able to more richly differentiate people without necessarily fully, you know, exhaustively taxonomizing them. So for instance, a lot of people are increasingly developing coding skills or are tinkering as part of the maker movement, and we'd say they probably have some set of computational thinking skills or instrumental knowledge in the milieu. So maybe they'd like some sort of interactive question answering interface. Similarly, activists closely following media reporting about AI ethics might initially be suspicious of an ML model. So rather than starting from a blank slate, maybe an interpretability system would accelerate an overall goal of building trust by starting with the immediate task of surfacing areas where the model is especially strong or limited in. And similarly, like I had mentioned before, you know, our framework generates the ability to identify new kinds of combinations of personas and need. 
again, going back to that example of debugging, which previous frameworks might have categorized as primarily a need that only AI experts or model developers or domain experts might have. Um, but instead, our framework, you know, suggests that everyday people might want to participate in that process as well. And in particular, that everyday people might have altogether different notions of error by drawing on their personal knowledge, either in the data domain or the milieu. And finally, in terms of comparative power, um, our framework provides a language for more carefully designing these sorts of, you know, application grounded studies. Um, they're pretty rare so far in the literature. Mostly, you know, we speculate because it's pretty difficult to know how to design them. Who should the participants be? How do we recruit them? What should they do? And in contrast, our framework provides a language for designing those more carefully. So for instance, a loan application system, our framework might suggest, well, uh, you know, it's not an ecologically valid study unless the participant pool draws from a rich diversity of people with personal knowledge in the milieu. And so, you know, this point about conducting application grounded studies, however, allows us to return to those initial questions I was posing, which were questions about systems building occurring in our community. What have we learned from these systems and are we making progress with regards to systems building? And there's maybe some reason for us to worry. Right, this tweet from Enrico Bertini in 2019, I think really well captures a concern that many of us have maybe shared, right? Are our systems much too complex? And I especially like Enrico's choice of wording here about a fetish for complexity. And indeed, in a contemporaneous CHI 2020 paper, Harman Preet Kaur and colleagues provided valuable data to back up this intuition. So they conducted a contextual inquiry with 11 participants, as well as a large scale survey of almost 200 data scientists to find that these data scientists overly trusted and misused interpretability tools with few participants able to accurately describe the visualizations output by these tools. That sounds uh, pretty problematic to me, right? So what's leading to this fetishization of complexity? And I think there are at least two intertwined issues at play. The first, in calling back to Fei-Fei Li's op-ed, is that although work in interpretability is fundamentally about human concerns, it's still relatively rare to see a lot of interpretability systems following you know, user-centric methods like a user-centric design process or the visualization design study methodology. And the second issue is that this is not specific to interpretability, but an issue that maybe um, lots of uh, the community has noticed about HCI and visualization systems building in general, is that it's tempting to stop at the systems building part, right? Often the most important part is actually what comes after, reflecting on what we've learned, either about how the system should be designed or about people and their processes now that the system exists. And I should say that I'm just as guilty of both of these mistakes um, as everybody else. And it's something that I'm, I'm learning to try and be better at. And so what I'd like to do is walk through a couple of projects in my group to unpack what it looks like to follow that user-centric design process, how it can lead to different outcomes than we're typically used to in visual analytics, and then attempt to reflect on the systems building process overall. And so I'd like to start with a project called the Embedding Comparator that was led by two graduate students here at MIT, Angie Bogust and Brandon Carter. And what Angie and Brandon started by doing was conducting formative interviews with 13 users who were comparing embeddings as part of their day-to-day -day work. And through these interviews, Angie and Brandon um, identified two different types of embedding users model-driven users, or folks who analyze and compare embeddings to develop a, a deeper knowledge of how their models work, and data-driven users who use the embeddings to understand something about their domain, right? Folks like computational biologists, linguists, who are investigating questions that are posed, um, you know, previously posed through non-computational methods. So things like the structural relationships between protein sequences and, and things like that. And across these two sets of, of users, um, through our interviews, we found some really interesting recurring sort of descriptions about their workflows. One participant called for sort of a global check and a local check workflow as the most reliable way they had to unearth unexpected relationships or confirm hypotheses. 
And many people, you know, exhibited similar sort of iterative behavior and also expressed concern that their current approaches were quite ad hoc. They were very reliant on who was performing the analysis and what their priors were. And the fact that you know, these existing workflows might actually yield analysis that was or might be perceived as being cherry picked. That concern was made worse by methods like you know, TSNI or Procrustes, where many users found that they were un unreliable because of how difficult it was to reproduce results. And that's either because of the stochasticity of many of these methods or their sensitivity to hyperparameters. And so many different participants told us that they've stopped using these methods altogether because, quote, you only find the story you want to tell. So based on these findings, we distilled a set of design goals and then worked through an iterative design process to yield this interface design. So what I'm showing you here is a comparison between two textual models, a generic one trained on the fast text data set and a, uh, a fine-tuned one um, trained for sentiment analysis using movie reviews scraped from IMDb. And so to allow users to more systematically generate insight in a reproducible way, what the embedding comparator does is it calculates a similarity score for every embedded object, in this case a word, in the embedding space. And this similarity score is called the reciprocal local neighborhood, or how many of an object's nearest neighbors are shared between the two models, and how many of them are unique. And that similarity score is then used to color, um, color and code points um, on the sidebar, um, as well as populate that histogram. And then it's used to basically uh, figure out which words we want to surface as part of these main views. And these main views are composed of these small multiple visualizations that we call local neighborhood dominoes. And they show the local neighborhoods for each of these words, as well as lists of similar and unique words. And of course, all of these views are interactive. So hovering over a domino maps that neighborhood back to the global plot. And the lists are sorted based on you know, the least and most similar words based on, you know, again, results from our formative interviews where we heard that you know, users often like to start at the extrema as a quick way to gut check the data, right? Catch any obvious errors before they go super deep on the analysis. And so through this way, you know, we're able to see how different words start to take on sentiment. So bomb, for instance, which was previously, um, you know, really associated with weapons and explosions, becoming fine-tuned um, in the case of, of movie reviews um, to take on some uh, sentiment for poorly performing movies. And of course, I can just go in and dive into the data by searching for specific words as well, looking at the way numbers take on interesting um, you know, sentiment as well. Uh, the fact that you know, seven and eight take on uh, you know, positive sentiment because people are referring to these scores as part of their, their reviews, um, but somehow that effect doesn't apply uniformly across other numbers like three, um, which seems to still be you know, 30, 37% similar between these two models. And of course, uh, you know, you might remember one of our findings was that users desired an ability to shift from the global to the local. And we interpreted this to mean more than just the classic sort of information seeking mantra, right? More than just overview first, then details on, on demand, but rather an opportunity to allow users to more dynamically determine what they mean by local and global, right? Determining where that boundary exists. And so people can tweak the size of the neighborhoods that are considered for that similarity score calculation, allowing them to balance between really hyper-localized phenomenon and more you know, um, a larger scale uh, stable phenomenon that might exist. Now, everything I've shown you so far is pretty standard visual analytics features, um, but it turns out in evaluative studies with 15 users, these users just absolutely loved it. Right? Um, so what we did was have users spend 60 to 90 minutes split between either the embedding comparator or the Jupyter Notebook, and we sort of counterbalance those two conditions to mimic their existing practices. And we measured the number of insights and the number of times they found some embedded object represented similarly or differently in a meaningful way, as well as theories. So were you know, users able to go from just that identification to then some more generate, you know, generalizable reason um, that that might occur? And as you might notice, you know, the embedding comparator just performs strictly superior to uh, Jupyter Notebooks. 
Um, but it's really kind of in the quotes that I think there's a lot of signals. So people said, you know, differences immediately popped out here. Um, here being the embedding comparator. And this was precisely what I was trying to articulate with the Jupyter Notebook. Another user says that the embedding comparator presented information in a better way. And just by doing that, we have some sort of breakthrough. And a final user was just so excited that they could imagine, you know, the ways in which the embedding comparator would be immediately useful to the research that they were hoping to conduct. Now, these sorts of insights, uh, the fact that the embedding comparator is such a, you know, seemingly straightforward, simple interface, all of this might seem trivial. But to me, given the findings from Harman Preet Kaur's study, I think these quotes are actually surfacing some meaningful signal about the sorts of things that can make interpretability systems more usable. The places where, you know, best practices and theory from visualization can just be applied in a straightforward fashion and where it might be better for us to really focus and spend our efforts. So, for instance, the fact that, you know, one of these participants said that the information is presented in, in a better way, well, what the embedding comparator is doing is actually working with Edward Tufte's maxim of privileging data variation over design variation. And this is something we've seen used successfully in, you know, visualization recommender systems like Data Voyager. Um, and it seems like it applies equally to interpretability, which is actually in contrast to prior systems, which have often primarily focused on deeply exploring one instance at a time. Similarly, it's not been clear to my group that we've needed to spend a lot of time developing new visual forms or interaction or visualization techniques. And we can see some evidence for that, you know, in the fact that folks said that things immediately popped out here. Right? So maybe it's better for us to spend more effort on developing abstractions for the tasks to structure and scaffold a process of interpretability to make it feel less like you're prospecting for gold and a process that you know, turns up insight more reliably. Now, I think the embedding comparator took a first uh, step with that local neighborhood similarity calculation. But maybe one thing you noticed through those little videos was that the process can still feel like it's overly reliant on serendipity. But can we actually analyze that in some more formal way? Well, again, we turn to our three powers, right? The embedding comparator introduced some representation for the task of comparing embeddings. How do those representations measure up? Well, I would say that the fact that you know uh, people were really quick to uncover insights suggests that the embedding comparator is giving people a comparative power and that they were able to use those to keep foraging for other insights, which maybe suggests a generative power. Now, where I think the embedding comparator falls short is the fact that it seemed like participants seemed to struggle with going from insights, right, identifying similarities and differences, to some sort of theory, some more generalizable recurring pattern. They were having trouble, you know, naming the phenomenon they were observing. And to me, this feels pretty analogous to the idea of a descriptive power. People could identify bits and pieces, but then had trouble sort of, you know, generalizing from that. So it could just be a sequence of one-off insights rather than deeper knowledge building. So as a next step, um, what my group and I turn to is this idea of saliency maps, right? A very common technique in interpretability where the idea is that you do this um, technique called feature attribution um, to identify you know, the features in the input, in this case, the pixels, that were most responsible for a particular output label. And it can almost feel like these visualizations are telling us something, but I would argue that what's actually happening is that our perceptual system is doing most of the semantic task, right? In this case, we know what a dog looks like. And so when we see pixels light up around its snout or its ears or spot, we're the ones bringing meaning to that process. And so in a project led by my PhD student, Angie Bogust, and with our collaborators, Ben Hoover and Hendrik Strobold at IBM Research, we started to develop metrics that had a bit more of that descriptive power. And these metrics we liken um, to ideas of precision and recall. If we imagine we have a set of saliency features as well as ground truth features, oftentimes you know, bounding boxes that humans have annotated on these data sets, we might be able to calculate three different types of coverages. 
a ground truth coverage, which determines how strictly the model relies on all the ground truth features. And this is kind of analogous to an idea of recall, right? It represents the proportion of the ground truth region covered by um, the explanation. And if we look at examples of low and high ground truth coverage, we can see that it measures the amount of the object the model is using to make its decision. So for example, correctly classified images with high ground truth coverage are instances where the model relies on the object and relevant background pixels, like the cab and the street, to make a correct prediction. On the other hand, incorrectly classified instances with high ground truth coverage are examples where the model overly relied on contextual information, such as using the keyboard and the man's lap to predict a laptop. Another type of coverage um, we call saliency coverage, which measures how strictly the model relies only on the ground truth uh, features. And this is a little bit analogous to ideas of precision, right? It represents the proportion of salient regions covered by the ground truth region, or how much of what the model says is salient actually is, how much of that saliency is signal versus noise. And so again, if we look at high saliency and low saliency regions, we might notice that correctly classified inputs with high saliency coverage are where just a subset of the objects, in this case, the dog's face, was sufficient to make a correct prediction. And on the other hand, incorrectly classified images with high uh, explanation coverage um, were instances where the model uses an insufficient portion of the image to make a prediction. Our final metric is the intersection of the union, which is the strictest metric and it measures how aligned the model's behavior is with human reasoning. A high IOU score indicates that the saliency and the ground truth are actually very similar, and IOU is maximized when the salient and ground truth regions are identical. And low IOU scores occur when the model's reasoning is actually quite unaligned with what a person has indicated as the ground truth. So for example, with the Arctic Fox, the two sets are entirely disjoint. The model is focusing on secondary objects like the fence and the background context like the snow to make the classification rather than the actual fox itself. On the other hand, if we continue to have an incorrect classification despite high coverage, that might suggest genuinely difficult to classify images that would be challenging even for a person. Like here, we've got a classification of a pickup truck, but the correct label was a snow plow, which seems like a reasonable guess to be honest. Now, is shared interest a better representation um, for measuring human AI alignment than ideas of sort of local neighborhood similarity that we were exploring in the embedding comparator? Well, again, let's turn to our descriptive, generative, and comparative powers. So for descriptive powers, um, you know, although I've been showing you, you know, just images, what we found was that using shared interest, we were able to identify eight recurring patterns in the ways that models for computer vision and natural language processing behaved. And we were able to give those recurring patterns particular names like human aligned, confuser, um, context dependent, context confusion. And these recurring patterns are basically combinations, not only of the prediction accuracy, um, but some combination of those shared interests, shared interest coverage metrics as well. So high IOU, low IOU, or some combination of ground truth and saliency coverage. In terms of comparative power, as you can see from um, you know, the screenshot, we were able to build another interface quite reminiscent of ideas um, from the embedding comparator, right? So this is an interface that we built um, and, and then tested uh, through a case study with a board certified dermatologist to understand how useful this model would be for them to de detect melanoma. And so what they did was rather than doing sort of piecemeal ad hoc exploration, they were able to use shared interest to better start to quantify alignment, sort and aggregate um, you know, the instances they were seeing using uh, the various metrics and those recurring patterns that we identified. So as they explored, you know, with this with this interface, what they found was, you know, they started by building trust in the model, looking at human aligned and context dependent categories. And in particular, you know, with context dependent, like we're seeing here, the dermatologist was excited and wondered whether the model was seeing something we're not truly appreciating in a clinical image. Maybe the model is really picking up on subtle changes we don't yet understand, but that the model does. 
But then unfortunately, you know, the, the, the dermatologist quickly lost trust in the model when they looked at the sufficient context and distractor cases, because these are things that, you know, uh, uh, suggest that the model just doesn't really understand these cases. And so the dermatologist actually wondered if there were ways that they could just use the model for, you know, human aligned and context dependent cases, um, and not so on instances um, that fall into, you know, distractor and, and insufficient context. So that gives us comparative power. What about generative power? Well, what's interesting about shared interest is we don't have to use it just to understand a model's performance, but we can also use it to query a model's latent space as well. So what we can do is pre-calculate saliencies for all classes that a model is trained on and then interactively specify the ground truth. Here, for example, the model is trained on ImageNet dog classes, and we can do a style of interactive what-if reasoning, right? Brushing smaller and smaller portions of the dog um, so that uh, to, to figure out, you know, how much does the model actually need to return a dog prediction? And it turns out, um, you know, as we follow this process through, um, it actually needs just the small portion of the dog's nose, right? That small, cute black nose. Um, and we still see it still returns, you know, sheep dog and, and Tibetan terrier and stuff like that. What's interesting though, is, is part of this generative power is we can probe the effect of other objects in the image as well. So although this model was trained to classify the dog and penalized for all other classifications, there are, you know, 1000 other classes in ImageNet. And so we could brush the hat to return sombrero, cowboy hat, um, you know, and, and maybe more interestingly, um, brush on objects that have no ImageNet class. For example, hat is not a label in ImageNet, but if we were to brush over it, we could see models associated with hands, including cleaver and notebook and spacebar, but also hen. Um, so I guess there are just a lot of images of people holding hens in, in the ImageNet data set. And so to me, this kind of points to the generative power that a representation like shared interest might have, right? Spurring new kinds of interfaces as well as new sorts of hypotheses that people might have about the way the model is operating. I've been pretty excited about this arc my group has been taking, following a user-centric process with the embedding comparator, and then beginning to generalize from that with shared interest. And I'd like to close by zooming out a little and pulling the threads of this talk together. If you remember, I opened the talk by posing these two questions about interpretability systems work. What have we learned because these systems exist and are we making meaningful progress? And to begin to answer those questions, I introduced this framing from Herb Simon about thinking about the representations of the problem space and using Michel Baudouin's Lafon's heuristics for evaluating the efficacy of those different representations. Now, with the embedding comparator and shared interest, I use those heuristics to evaluate individual contributions, but often, and, and, and what Michel Baudouin Lafon developed those heuristics for, was to actually evaluate you know, the overall problem space, or in our case, the overall space of interpretability systems. And what I mean by that is each of these interpretability systems are themselves just one point in a larger design space. And this is an idea that my collaborators and I gestured at in this distill article on the building blocks of interpretability. And what, what we can often tend to do is when we're primarily operating in systems building mode, it can sometimes be easy to lose track of the fact that each of these individual systems is a composition of a set of primitives. And if we look across the systems, we see that they often are, in fact, recompositions of the same set of primitives. And I don't see that as a bad thing at all, but rather a really exciting opportunity. Rather than developing ever more novel visual and interactive idioms that users have trouble understanding, what if we were able to more closely reflect on the systems we have collectively produced already? The fact that so many systems are finding different ways of combining and recombining the same basic set of primitives suggests to me that there is some basic latent representation of interpretability interfaces that we haven't yet discovered. A way of fitting these primitives together in a more systematic way. For visualization researchers in the audience, this might sound awfully familiar. In visualization, we do have such a representation, we call it the grammar of graphics. And although I don't know yet if there is a similar grammatical representation for interpretability interfaces, though I'm not necessarily ruling it out entirely, 
I nevertheless believe there is some intermediate representation that spans the individual systems that we have today. But to discover such a representation, we need to kind of abstract our thinking a little bit, to go from individual tools to toolkits, or systems that allow users to build their own custom one-off interpretability interfaces. Now in visualization, we didn't just leap to grammar of graphics, and I can imagine toolkit work and interpretability following a very analogous trajectory, starting from the individual systems that we have today to component-based toolkits where users can select from a palette of techniques to assemble their interfaces together, through to you know, potential gr grammars that decompose those components into a more fundamental set of cross-cutting and compo uh, composable primitives. And we already perhaps see the first steps towards you know, this trajectory with applications like TensorBoard, where you can in fact you know, assemble your own kind of dashboard. But what's important here to note is that toolkit work isn't merely about letting users build their own interfaces, but rather that the design of the toolkit itself, the choice of which abstractions to surface, how they might map to you know, model architectures, how they might compose together, the design of the toolkit um, offers what is called a path of least resistance, right? It influences the sorts of interfaces that end users create and leads people towards better ways of doing things and away from doing incorrect or ineffective things. And I should note that this idea, this path of least resistance, um, is something that has been studied in the HCI literature and was a phrase coined by HCI pioneers Brad Myers, Scott Hudson, and Randy Pausch. And in industry, this phenomenon is often described as being opinionated software, right? The opinion being a theory about the right way of composing these pieces together. So how do we move from one stage to the next? Now, this is where I think applying Michel Baudouin Lafont's framework is helpful. To shift from individual systems to component-based toolkits, we need to develop representations that exhibit some sort of descriptive power. We need to identify what those recurring components are, give them names, and figure out the ways that they fit together to recreate the existing space of interpretability systems. But it's not clear to me that component-based toolkits are enough to allow us to you know, very systematically generate, imagine new interpretability systems. And that's where, you know, if we were able to break components down into more fundamental cross-cutting primitives, um, we might yield, you know, grammars that give us a generative power. And I've kind of put a question mark here because, um, you know, this step, it's difficult to tell how well the analogy to visualization holds. One of the benefits of visualization is that the design space is both very rich, but well constrained. And so those constraints allow us to yield something that has a grammatical structure. Perhaps we'll get there with interpretability interfaces. And in our distill article, we sketched out some ideas of what a grammar for interpretability might look like. But I think there's quite a, you know, a tall mountain of work to do to turn those sketches into a reality. But what about comparative power? My hunch is that part of the reason it's been difficult to build generalizable knowledge and interpretability is that when we conduct application-grounded evaluations, we're typically targeting full systems. So when we make some discovery about how people think with these interfaces, what works well, what doesn't, it can be difficult to tease apart cause and effect. What specific aspect of the system design led to that observation? Instead, if we were to use these toolkit-based representations to craft conditions for our evaluations, we would be perhaps able to more systematically vary and isolate individual components or grammatical primitives as experimental variables. And by running these evaluations with a diverse range of stakeholders and using our earlier framework of knowledge, context, and needs, we might be able to discover mappings between stakeholder characteristics and the design of interpretability systems. And if we were at that stage, it's perhaps not unreasonable to believe that we would be on our way towards developing a theory of interpretability. One can dream. It's certainly a trajectory that I am especially excited about, and one that my students and I are starting to you know, uh, uh, work our way through um, over the past few years. And so with that, I'd like to wrap up by acknowledging all the fantastic members of my research group who, along with our many collaborators over the years, have really helped shape my thinking in this problem space and are helping me push this research agenda forward. Thank you.